The following is a conversation. It has the features of any conversation, such as imperfectly expressed thoughts, ill-considered opinions, and the notions of several sleep-deprived brains. Try not to get your stethoscope in a twist about it. Hey, I think football is among the least important pastimes to be passionate about. But I don't know if I'm in the minority in this room. You got my vote. Do you? What about you? What about you all? Strongly disagree. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. But I felt bad for Aaron Rodgers this week because mm-hmm. that sounds like a sucky injury. So I'm laughing because it took me more than 24 hours to realize they weren't actually talking about A-Rod, who oh, plays yeah. for the Yankees. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, not even the right sport, not even the right season. I don't know what was wrong with me. I was like, oh, the, the other. No, no, you're tired too? For, for, somebody who does not, for somebody who does not sport, I also had to make some sort of mental accommodation for the A-Rod Aaron Rodgers thing. I'm not really sure what my problem is. But anyway, <laughs> I, I did find it interesting that there, did you read about this bar? This bar, I think it was in New York. And they were like, free drinks if the Jets lose. <laughs> right? Because they were like, the Jets are going to win. Free drinks if the Jets lose. And when Aaron Rodgers, apparently when Aaron Rodgers tore his Achilles, People started running up their bar tabs because they were like, oh, this is awesome. Free drinks. And then it turned out to be turned out that the Jets won. Right. And I just think that's wonderful. (laughs) They played the odds and the odds won. I just think that's the most wonderful thing because I'm like, you passionate people who thought you were going to thought you knew everything about sport. Yes. That's messed up that someone ruptured his tendon and they all started buying drinks I, that's, yeah. and that's part of it too yeah. i'm like sports is weird if, to me it's weird sports is weird sports is weird to me you know like we have all this we have all this evidence that you know people's brains are falling out because <laughs> they get injured in 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 football and you know teenagers are having their brains beat out in football and all this kind of stuff and you know poor aaron Rodgers, he's, he's you know got no Achilles heel anymore and people are like oh they're very passionate about it. I'm like oh this is this is terrible <laughs> so, so you know what a parasocial relationship is uh uh-uh. okay it's the idea that you feel it's a one-sided relationship that you have with say a celebrity yeah. right so it's when somebody like feels really connected to Taylor Swift through her songs or okay, whatever sure, right sure. Taylor Swift doesn't know who this person is why would she right she's got a billion fans or whatever this is a personal attack (laughs) Um, Uh, it could be anybody but sports creates a parasocial she doesn't know you hind (laughs) sports creates a parasocial relationship with the team right so you feel like you're a member of this team yeah and I guess in some sense, like it's a quasi religious experience in the sense that it brings people together for a, co- for a common cause that's bigger than themselves. And, and it can be kind of beautiful if you've ever been in a stadium where everybody's singing the same song and it's cute, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like going to church, but I, I have a problem with it when it becomes so tribal that there are like enemies, right? Or that you feel a certain ownership of the players like Aaron Rodgers. There were a lot of people in the Midwest that are very upset that he left the local team and went to New York, right? Sure, but and yeah, the, because ignoring of that, were, the fact that the the man has a career He's, and a family, right? And, you know, other things besides the city of Green Bay to pay homage to, right, right, right. right. And they were celebrating when he was injured because he's the traitor, right? So he's left the tribe, therefore he is the enemy. And yeah. I'm like, I just... Rude. That's the aspect of sports, really any kind of tribalism that I just... Not a fan of. Call me a grumpy grouch. Would but, you sports yeah. fans like to counterpoint? I, I want to make sure that... Well, I'm or actually, T-Swift fans, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually a Packers fan. Oh, okay. Um, so to hear the news about Aaron Rodgers, I did feel bad because it is a tough injury. There was a small part of me on the inside that was like, okay, like vindication. Yeah, he played a little, a couple of games with us, like mentally for the past couple of years about him leaving or not, and I'm like, okay, yeah, you left. Like, sorry, but it's okay like i don't have to feel bad for you yeah and he like left and took a few of like the packers good players too so okay maybe a little bit of karma yeah but 
Sch- Schadenfreude is a it's, it's a thing. It's yeah. A thing, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't feel like super bad for him. Like it's a bad injury, but like mm-hmm. also I've been told I have it on good authority that he's like Hall of Fame material. Yeah. He's making fifty million dollars this season. Like I don't feel that bad for him. Like he's okay in life, right? Like yeah. he'll recover from this emotionally yes. and he'll move on. And, and yeah. also his Achilles heel will recover to the point where at least he can walk around. And he's yeah. Gonna, yeah. I mean, he yeah. may not play anymore, but I think he's had he's a, had enough. A he's successful had a good, he's career, had a, great a wonderful career. life. He'll be fine. Yeah. But I guess, yeah, I've just never, I don't think that I've ever been part, felt so, so much possession of a group or a tribe that when somebody leaves it, I feel shot in Freud when they fail. Yeah. And uh, sports will bring that out in us, I think. And I don't understand it as much. Denver, the, when the Broncos win that whole week that the city is just alive, everyone's happy, they're living life. And when the Broncos lose, there's a cloud over the entire city. And Aww. every week, people are like, we got him next week. We got him next week. And they're always ready to get just pummeled again. And I don't get it. You, I don't understand. <laughs> the triumph of hope over experience. It's, right? Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> and it's, I always hold on to when we had at Elway and Manning in that preseason where Tim Tebow, he mm-hmm. was good. They hold on to that. Every other time, it's like, they're not that good. And everyone's yeah. just, they're the best team in the country. The streets of, I'm from Denver. The streets of Denver will be orange on Saturdays <laughs> when they're playing or Sundays. And it's like, we're with terrible. What? Yeah. Orange with what? The shirts, like the, their colors oh, are blue okay. and orange. Yeah. Like they paint the streets every week. That's, oh, no. cool. That's commitment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, they, people are committed and they are diehard fans. And it's just, all right, enjoy. <laughs> I get, I, so to, to be fair, so the reason why I have a little bit of a not f- strong feelings about sports or I guess strong feelings against is I've moved a lot as a child. And so I never really had a home team. One, two, a couple of the places I lived were the Bay Area. So I dealt with oh. Raiders fans and then the SEC really any of them but specifically i'm not not gonna name the school but they would like for exhibition games they would roll cars like they were just whoa way intense right and i Raiders think, fans I think is the same thing yeah like i think for me it's not sports fandom per se that puzzles me i think it's the extremes that people take it to it's fanaticism yeah. right that, yeah. that make me go oh, i don't this makes me feel uncomfortable yeah i didn't mean to attack the sports fans <laughs> no i just okay. i just found something to talk about for our cold open today yeah. <laughs> meandering in the margins of medicine it's the short coat podcast Weird news, fresh views, helpful clues, and interviews. By students, for students. Subscribe to our weekly show at theshortcoat.com. Welcome back to the Short Code Podcast. It's the show that gives you an inside look at medical school from the students. Drinking from that fire hose, a production of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. I'm Dave Adler. You can feast your eyes on my lovely co-host today if you watch us on YouTube. Because in the SCP studio... We've got a bunch of people. His fullness of charm and wonders abound such that words alone cannot capture his measureless beauty. It's M2 Jeff Goddard. I have been called a prince before. All of nature seems to rejoice under her tender glow, alive and overflowing with beauty. It's PA1 Olivia Quinby. Happy to be here. He caresses the land with his warm and golden rays, casting a luminous glow upon the verdant hills and meadows. It's PA1 Noah Vasquez. Good to be here. And her voice is a song of joy from birds filling the perfumed air there. Euphonious melodies echoing across an idyllic countryside. It's M2 Hind Al Kalani. Hey, people. Got some new co hosts in the house today. New PA1s. How's it going? How's it going? You all right? It's, it's a, going. It's a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, I'm gl- a fun one? Uh, At times. It's a lot of ups and downs, but like yeah. steep ups yeah. and downs. Yeah. Any loop the loops? Not yet. Not yet. I've been told there are a few, though. Yeah, get ready. (laughs) I'm guessing Friday will be that loop-de-loop with our anatomy exam. It's a good start, yeah. 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 We'll do great. (laughs) Yeah. Rooting for you. And this is exam two of the eight weeks that we have? Yep, eight weeks straight. Yep. Freedom November 3rd. (laughs) Count down the days. Well, welcome. I'm glad you haven't... I'm glad you've at least lasted this long and haven't dropped out because it's... (laughs) What the hell am I saying? (laughs) What's wrong with me? (laughs) What is uh, is wrong with me? Welcome to the show, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Not sure why you'd come back at this point, but you can at some point. Uh, Jeff, I heard you spent some time at the State House. Oh, 
Oh, well, I spent some time somewhere. Uh, I not went at to, the state house? I not think. at the state house. There's a building. Oh, gosh, can't remember the name of it. But the hall was the Norman Borlaug Hall oh. inside the building, which I really appreciated. I think the building is run by some World Food Forum, something along the lines of that. So for those of you who don't know or are not from Iowa, Norman Borlaug won a Nobel Peace Prize in the year 1970 because he devised, he's a biotechnologist, he devised a form of wheat that grows shorter so that you can grow more wheat per stock without it falling over and damaging or dying, right? King. Yeah. Billions of people. (laughs) There is literally not a person who has ever lived who has done more for like his direct actions have caused more people to be alive than any other person that's ever lived. Okay. Right. Um, several billion people alive today owe their lives to his efforts. Okay. That's something to hang your hat on. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so there's a foundation and Iowa is rightfully pretty proud of the fact that we have fed the world. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not from Iowa, but here I am claiming, um, so they have this, uh, their hunger forum every year and our hunger summit, sorry. And I was invited to give a 45 minute presentation on the work that I was doing in South Africa, um, this last summer. And, uh, it was, wow, those people really care. And that, that was just so powerful to see so many people like trying to actually figure out how do we address this issue? Great. We in the world provide, we produce about one and a half times the food we need to feed every human being on the planet. So we are a post-scarcity society that has not yet realized that we are a post-scarcity society. The only reason that there are people hungry in the world is because we haven't gotten food to them. We can't get it to them. I can't is a strong word. I would say we have not prioritized getting food okay. to them. Right. And that, for some people, that might you know make them feel kind of down. But for me, that gives me so much hope. Like the I mean, problem at this point it. isn't we've that we can't food. do it's it. It's the last yeah. mile stuff. Yeah. And, and that's just, that's relationship stuff. That's building communities, right? I mean, I don't care if the corn grown in Iowa goes to some kid in the Sudan or if it goes to some kid in Guatemala or if it goes to some kid in Iowa. I just want all kids to have food, you know, and we can do that now. What a beautiful thought. And these people are every year getting together and talking about how they're doing that and then going out and doing it. Oh, it's beautiful. Amazing. Yeah. So. Well, thanks for telling us about it. Yeah, of course. What did I talk today about motherhood? It's a revered institution in this country, but that reverence is not without a certain ambivalence. Moms are both celebrated and judged, and nowhere is that judgment more prevalent, I think, than in medicine. I think it's I, it, it seems to be like human nature to judge parents, right? <laughs> Negatively or positively, like we're always looking to, to judge people. I think we just like judging people. I think we, maybe yeah, that's it's, it. It's, yeah. <laughs> I think parents feel it. It's just, that's such an important job. So we feel like we get an extra dose of judgment to to give out. (laughs) And and during pregnancy, you know, not to make too much light of it, during pregnancy can be fatal. Uh, Maternal deaths remain way too high in the U.S. Uh, The maternal mortality rate in the U.S. has risen from 17.4 per 100,000 live births in 2018 to 32.9 in 2021. That's just a couple of years. With higher rates among black and native women, over 80% of maternal deaths are preventable. In a CDC survey, one in five women reported mistreatment during pregnancy with higher, and I'm, I think that's mistreatment by in medicine, mm-hmm. with higher rates reported by women of color. Common issues were lack of response to requests for help, being shouted at or scolded by providers, sorry, by providers, privacy violations, uh, threats to withhold treatment. 45% of women reported not sharing concerns with providers, often because they thought issues were normal or didn't want to, they didn't want to complain. So there's a communication problem there. So my question for you guys to talk about today is, how do we fix this? How do we open those lines of communication between patients and practitioners to ensure that their concerns are voiced and addressed you know like why are we so bad at this Mm -hmm. one that comes like to mind really quickly is like at least like i know in iowa like i was like i think number 50 in states in the country for the number of ob providers per um, capita yeah in the Mm -hmm. state and it's gotten a lot worse very quickly i think it was like I saw this map. There's a faculty member here who does research on this and he was like presenting and like half of the counties in Iowa don't even have one. I think one obstetrician gynecologist. I don't know about other types of providers, 
but and, and the, the number of hospitals that have OB services have has dropped dramatically and I'm wondering if like number one an increased lack of access and then the the places that are left to get care if they're like super understaffed you know I, I don't think there's hopefully there's not any providers who show up every day ready to like scold their patients like that's so messed up but if they're super stressed and don't have the funding they need i can see how patients can fall through the cracks mm -hmm. and not get the care that they need so i that's obviously like one percent of this explanation but i'm wondering if maybe that's a part of it well i mean i don't know it might be a large part of it i mean you're right. It's awfully hard to be present and with your patients when you've got, you know, 30 more patients to get through or whatever the number is. Yeah. Or you just don't exist. By the end right? of it. Right. Or you're just not there. Yeah. I, so my argument on this is we have a healthcare model. I think calling it a system would be a bit of a stretch, but we have a model wherein we like to work on the margins, Right. And that means that you do everything you can. And so like a restaurant, right? Like you staff it as little as possible to make sure that the needs are met. Okay. You do the same thing in a hospital. You don't want to have, have too many people you don't around overspend. because you don't want to spend too much money. Yeah, you, you don't want to overspend. So you don't want too many people in the hospital at any given time. You don't want to buy too many resources, like too many supplies that you're not going to need, right? Yeah, this so, is like the just-in-time a model of like, what's the word? Inventory, just in time inventory. Yeah. But for medicine. Yeah. Yeah. And you can I'm see fucking and cut that right out. No, I like it. <laughs> if mine stays in, yours stays in. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> in some things, right. you want that just in time inventory, right? So think perishable foods. That's a phenomenal model where we're. Our supply chain really works well with the fact that we don't over or undersell ourselves, right? Yeah. It makes it hard to like really figure out what that should be that doesn't work so well on things like healthcare because you're you're constantly pushing that line and you're trying to see where you can cut it and all of a sudden nurses are having to advocate for laws limiting like how many nurses are allowed to be on a shift per bed or something like that you yeah, know what i'm yeah, talking yeah, about yeah, like yeah. one nurse shouldn't be handling 30 patients at a time somebody's going to fall through the cracks yeah. so they're having to call for laws creating mandatory minimums Instead of the healthcare system simply saying, this is what's safest for the hospital and for the patients, we're just going to do the right thing. The doctors are the same way. You know, if, if practices or even these large organizations are specifically trying to make sure that we have the bare minimum number of doctors on staff at any given moment to save us money, that means that patients are going to fall through the cracks and their needs are not going to get met because we're stretched. And the only way around it is if we can try to lean off of that profit driven motive. I don't think that you have to take money entirely out of healthcare for that to be the case, but you well, do. Well, there's no way to do that, right? You need to be, pay people for their yeah. work and you need to you yeah. know, have I mean, money for the MRI machine or whatever, you know, you look at countries like, um, uh, Canada or Germany or these countries that definitely, well, I mean, they have either single barrier or they have forms of insurance that is highly regulated, but all of their hospital systems are still, private right they're still owned by organizations they're just such that the profit isn't the primary motive and their systems seem to work better and all of a sudden you don't have the highest mortality rate for mothers in the world or being the only country where that number is actually increasing that's terrifying i mean that's crazy it's yeah. considering that we mm -hmm. you know sort of view ourselves as being very you know very technologically advanced we have the best equipment we have the best you know hospitals and we're still kind of failing in this very important measure of success, yeah. actually keeping people alive. I think that's, that's a little scary. It's kind of fitting that we're doing this this topic today because we just got a lecture on this exact thing. Really? Um, I was going to say the same yeah. thing, Noah. Yep. And, uh, implicit biases and how that can affect healthcare for people who are not necessarily our in-group and how that gets exasperated when you're under stress, you're worrying about all these other things, have too many patients. And I do think it's kind of interesting that's happened, the, the, the study you mentioned, that it happened across COVID also, mm -hmm. where even more resources are stressed, even more people are spread even thinner. And it's, I don't know. Yeah, this wasn't, an, I mean, I, we've talked about this general topic a few times on the show in, in for 
you know, several times in years past. And I'll continue to bring it up because I think it's such an important problem that we really need to, you know, that we really need to solve. And I've only got this podcast to do it with. So, um, <laughs> so I'll just keep bringing it up. But um, yeah, I'm glad they, uh, I'm glad that comes up in the curriculum for sure. As I was reading it, you, you could tell that it was an article. I mean, they want to spread the news. They want everyone to know kind of what's going on. But it was cool as a, a current student to say, hey, we are addressing this. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, the future providers of this country are conscious of this stuff happening and we're learning it. We've been in school for two months and we're already not even, not, two, not months. even two months and we're already getting lectures on how to maintain our own kind of care across all people that we could ever interact with Mm -hmm. i think that's pretty cool yeah and i think from a patient perspective motherhood can be very vulnerable and it can be hard at times to share your concerns with who is taking care of you and so i feel like we as students can probably take that implicit bias test that we discussed in our class today and really make sure that we're aware of how we can improve and make sure that patients can feel comfortable enough to bring up their concerns or what's not right so we can reduce those outcomes. I think that comes with with the weight of the white coat. Uh, since being here, just been kind of thinking about a few people have mentioned the white coat has weight. The white coat means something. And I think, I mean, yeah, you got to know what you're talking about. You got to know how to treat people. You got to know the basic information. But I think it also is kind of, you got to understand that you're here to treat everyone. It is your job to make everyone else comfortable rather than their job to be comfortable with you. Like We need to address those things, take those tests, see where we are wrong, mm-hmm. be aware of that, and then fix it so everyone can receive proper care. Short Coats, we love to hear from you, no matter what it's about. So call us at 347-SHORT-CT with questions, shower thoughts, complaints about your situation, whatever you like. We'll talk about it on the show. I really like that thought of pregnancy like being pregnant as like feelings of vulnerability coming with it and we really yeah we have to make sure that our patients are comfortable advocating for themselves and feel like they have the space to say those things and that can apply to any condition right like Mm -hmm. there's some i'm i mean pregnancy is the perfect example of maybe having shame with a diagnosis or like let's say your pregnancy isn't playing out perfectly like in a movie or something like that and you're, you have like this wonderful glow and you're happy and you're excited about your baby coming and stuff like that like that doesn't happen yeah, let's say you feel like shit most of the time <laughs> yeah. that's, that's and, how, and your legs I are think, swollen yeah. and you can't see your toes or like you know like I, a, a patient could also be confused of why am i not feeling the way i thought i was going to gonna feel mm-hmm. or like is there something wrong with me for not having this perfect pregnancy and being able to bring that up on its own, even if you're in like the perfect hospital environment and everyone's looking out for you all the time, that's hard. Yeah. So trying to do that in like a stressed environment and your nurse is mean or like your provider's a jerk or something, like how are you gonna do that? Shame shame among patients is a big problem for medicine. Mm-hmm. And so we have this video on YouTube from a while back where we had a urologist, she's no longer at the university, but Amy Perlman was on the show. And she talked all about being a urologist in men's health, right? None of our videos have gotten as many comments as this video has. And they're all like basically from men saying, you know, it's too embarrassing to see a woman urologist. And I think that comes from... You know, from what they're saying, I think that just comes from like, I don't know, the shame that we experience just being human Mm -hmm. and having problems that, you know, you don't want to talk to just anybody about. Um, So, you know, I have a, you know, I I, intellectually, I sympathize with that point of view. I, I would hope that, you know, if I had to see a female urologist, I'd be fine with it. But I kind of understand it. I don't think I would express it the way that some of these commenters on our YouTube <laughs> channel have, but you know, that's just me. I, I used to be a phlebotomist and ended up drawing a female urologist and I asked her, Hey, how does it work with everything? And her husband actually worked at the same practice she did. 
And she kind of laughed and chuckled. People have asked her that a few times. Sure. And she says, well, I have a lot more patience than he does. And I'm kind of confused. Why is that? And she said, well, this is my finger. And it's this tiny little dainty <laughs> thing. And my husband's are probably about three times the size of this. And then she just left. And I'm just sitting there. Oh, okay then. I think I understand. Yes. <laughs> That's so, great. Yeah. And I mean, the thing, the, it, it goes the same for... OB and, and men, right? So I have already been asked to step out of a room because I'm a man and they weren't comfortable with me being in the room. That's, I mean, because I've actually considered, like, this is the patient population that in the United States right now it seems to be the most vulnerable. There would be value in me going into this field um, and trying to be an advocate for these patients. But that doesn't really work if the patients don't want to see me. You know, yeah. I want to be able to make sure that they're getting the care that they deserve even if that means that they don't want to see me, but I don't know. It's hard. I've run into that a few times too, just interacting with patients. So I think there's some, you said just being a male in medicine because there's, there is that kind of gender difference Mm -hmm. where we, at least I feel like as, as a male, sometimes women don't want to share things with us and it's kind of be like, but that's my job. I need to help. I need to do this kind of thing. But you can't. It's the best thing to you do is just leave. To do it, yeah. yeah, and it's, it's and, and and you want them to come back. So you you, yeah. and you not not necessarily to you, but to somebody. So mm-hmm. you can't basically be like, well, I'm who you got. So open up. Yeah, it's it's a fine line. I think yeah. where you're you want to do enough, but you can't do too much. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think it's based back to how our society is structured and the culture that we have been a part of for so many years. And I don't think that's going to change until our community can rethink about who can take care of me and what I'm comfortable sharing with certain individuals. Yeah. Or being somebody worth sharing things with, right? Like, mm-hmm. like as you, you said earlier, it's not their job to be comfortable with us. It's our job to make them comfortable. Yeah. I, th- there was one thing in this article that I questioned mm-hmm. or I didn't understand. And that was just that, the one. Ju- I mean, there's always many, but this is the one that I remember. <laughs> the if you didn't have insurance, if you're a woman who did not have, if you're a mom who didn't have insurance, you got worse care, or you were more likely to be mistreated. I think was what I read. Mm-hmm. No, that that I checks. That too. I, but my that question checks. is like, when you're in, when you're a a PA, a physician, a nurse, whatever. Do you know that information when you walk into the room? Is that something you know? Are the I mean, when you get the schedule from like the people out front, are they like, hey, this person doesn't have insurance or this person does have insurance? Like, how does that work? I, I don't know that we can answer that question in this room, but it seemed like because you guys are not necess- haven't really been in clinic yet. I think it's in the chart. Like you can, I mean it must be in the chart, right? Yeah. It is in the mm-hmm. chart. It is in fact in the chart. And if you work in private practice, depending on the relationship you have with your front desk, that's something that you will be explicitly told, right? And there are surrogates. I think that's the nicest way to say that. There if you have a patient that comes in that is of lower socioeconomic status, they are going to get worse treatment. They are also very likely to be the patients who do not have insurance. So it's which one is causing it. I'm not here to say, but those things are associated, right? I heard this week that um, we've reached the lowest number of insured patients in the past few years after the COVID after the COVID relief money basically mm-hmm. expired. Mm-hmm. Um, the I might be conflating two things. I might be conflating poverty and insurance. But basically, you know, the COVID protections. There's a reasonable I, I association. Mean, there, but after the COVID relief expired, people, a lot of people lost their insurance. Mm-hmm. And and so that's a, sort of an ongoing problem. Yeah. This is why I don't. Yeah. I, I Once again, like every time I re- I don't know if it's just the the articles that I'm reading or if it's, you know, something else, if it's truth. But. The more I spend time thinking about this, the less enthusiastic I, I am about money in medicine and yeah. the profit motive for money in medicine. It just seems like it doesn't work all that well. There's, you know, we need to change our ideas about how medicine, how we can pay for this. Yeah. Instead of thinking of, 
you know, patients as money makers. I will. Yeah. I just want to interject with one very tangential at this point idea that I've been. That we had talked about this before, David. That there is at least anecdotal evidence that people providers are leaving states based off of laws around reproductive health care. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that is creating an even greater dearth of these providers. Like I was already number 50. And if more and more OBs, which had been leaving before for other reasons, if they, if even more leave because of this, other people are going to suffer. And I had somebody, I was talking about this online with somebody, just a gym of a man. That's the first red flag. I've never heard that term before. Yeah, what does that mean? Who is Jim? <laughs> Who is Jim? He I, was, thought I, I thought I misheard it. I thought it was a gem of a man. Gem, yes. Like you G- said gem. G-E-M. Oh! oh! A gem of a man. I thought you said Jim. Yeah. Me too. No, Who is Jim? Yeah. He is a gem. Um, he, he was very adamant against the idea of most reproductive health care, it seemed. He's... I, you know, for for whatever reason, he he just falls that way politically. He just doesn't think that it sh- that most of these things should be provided. And I mentioned that uh, it's not just people that are seeking, for example, for medical necessities, they might be seeking an abortion. It's not just those patients that are going to suffer. If providers are leaving states because they can no longer provide that service, they are also not providing any service because they're not there anymore. And every single patient is going to suffer. And there didn't seem to be a lot of sympathy for that argument with this particular individual, but... Well, because I think the counter argument would be, well, they shouldn't be providing that nasty service in the first place. They should be providing all of the other services and be content with that. Well, his argument was if they want to provide that service, they shouldn't be doctors at all. And I was like, I've heard this argument on the flip. You know, I've definitely heard people in medicine say that if you aren't comfortable with abortion services, you shouldn't be a doctor. This was the first time that I think that I've heard somebody on the other side saying that if you are comfortable with it, you shouldn't be a doctor. And I thought, wow, this is such a polarizing Interesting. issue. Yeah. yeah. So so many people want to just take doctors away from everybody. I don't know. I just want to clarify. This was a man, right? Yeah, that was so, that was the first red flag. Yeah. Never really interacted with that side of medicine, I assume, much at all. Yeah, uh, yeah no. Yeah. No experience at all with it, you know. And I currently, uh, not to get overly personal, but I currently have a, a very close relative who is pregnant and hospitalized because of complications due to that pregnancy and uh it's it's close you know so like i might be a little too emotional to be talking about this on the internet with strangers but sorry to hear that i mean the thing is i think we've all heard of we've all had family members who have been in difficult positions before even if they weren't affected by these sort of changes that we've been experiencing yeah yeah, and she's a nurse. And so I you know, I, I hesitate to think what kind of care she would have gotten if she didn't have the insider track, you know, if yeah. she didn't know the people in the hospital, she, she didn't, didn't know have how that to extra ask for care. that extra ability to advocate for herself. Yeah. To even just be to know the lingo, to be able to say, This is what I have you know. Or unfortunately in this country, if she had more melanin in her skin, she might be in a much worse place. Yeah. And that's scary to think about, you know. And how do we fix that? I don't have the answers, right? But it's going to be, we need a lot more OBs. I think that's going to be a big yeah, part of it. It's not going to be for them to go away. Yeah. That's, <laughs> it's more of them, not less of them. Yeah, yeah. In the United States, this is just a fun fact for everybody in the room. In typical countries will have yeah, you maybe. You people on the internet, don't listen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not for you. The typical country has about 50% of their uh, physician workforces in primary care. In the United States, it's closer to 30%. I think it's like 32-ish percent. That's not good. And how do we fix that? It's getting back to the money thing. But we need more primary care providers because there is no other specialty that has an impact on the community for overall health quite like primary care. No no other specialty comes close. That's the person you go to for everything. My, My wife, her primary care doctor is her OB. You know, that's who she talks to about everything. Yeah. So I have to ask, two M2s. What does your guys' future look like? What's the end goal? <laughs> this Friday. That is so funny because I was gonna Friday. I was gonna ask you you youngsters you PAs uh, oh you yeah. PAs what you were thinking as well because I feel like I know for these guys I definitely feel like I know for you <laughs> I'm not quiet about it <laughs> I'm not as sure for you i don't so i'm thinking ophthalmology which is very specialized sorry but, but hey, I look eyeballs are important guys, too yeah. they are yeah 
I think, we, yeah. I, more than any other thing. That's how we get around. So we, we need that to figure things out. You're right. Yeah. And granted, I haven't been on one rotation yet, so that might change. But I really love it. I think... I like ophthalmology because you can. This is a complete 180. <laughs> like, what are we talking about? This but, is fine. I think we covered the topic. We can uh, talk about eyeballs for a bit. We can talk about eyeballs. Yeah, I, I love it because it's surgical and you see your patients in clinic as well. And the surgery is really. I got to shadow a couple and I was just blown away. Like, it's very. You have to have really good hand coordination and all the surgeries are done on like microscopes. Like you're looking using a microscope because it's like really not like a like like a light microscope, okay. but like <laughs> like a surgical It's like microscope. zoomed in. Yeah, yeah. yeah, if the, <laughs> yeah. And it's very coordinated and the team has to work together and be fast. And the patients are like awake. I was watching cornea what cataract surgeries and I know that's they're just chilling. Wild. Yeah, and and you're like <laughs> Faco emulsifying their lens and vacuuming it out and putting a new one and i just what do you mean you're emulsifying their it's, lens it's a, a, a okay so you, I, in, you basically in my walks mind, through it and, walks through it in my one mind the they went in there with the tweezers and was like boink and took it out <laughs> no, you have in to case wait. anybody isn't watching this on youtube one of the pas is is actively tearing up talking no. about this i can't <laughs> i don't like eye stuff no that's <laughs> oh yeah um that that that's what i'm interested in i want to um, tell me about emulsifying yeah what does that mean so okay so it's just like a fancy word for like so Basically, they don't want to like cut open the whole eyeball to get the lens out, yeah. right? Because like the lens is like a solid, like it's a thing, and it's also three D, right? So it's not just like a, yeah, a flat, it's like three D. So you can't flat, really yeah. just pull it out. Can't like roll it up and like take it out. Exactly, of the okay. <laughs> roll it up. I like that. That'd be cool. But so you take like a little like sonic vacuum. You make like a very tiny incision, mm -hmm. and then you take a sonic vacuum, stick it in there, and then I'm sorry, you're <laughs> fine, you're like, <laughs> and send like ultrasound waves or some kind of wave. I forget. And it breaks up the lens. Okay. And then the same thing that you inserted can switch to a vacuum and it will vacuum up all that like broken up lens okay. out. So you kind of blown my mind here because yeah, I really did think it was like, a, you know, like a like they like opened your eyeball <laughs> like a window and like took out the little with a tweezer, a little lens, maybe pulled it out through the pupil. Close it back. Close give it, back it a good pat. Yeah. Well, you know, put something back in there. Do you want to know why they can use sonic waves to do this? Sure. Okay. Versus you would not be able to do this if it were just sitting in the air. Okay. Because liquids are a non-compressible fluid. Oh, sure. Okay. I talk about this quite a bit, as often as I can, because it is so exciting. Because it cannot be compressed, the energy is conserved completely, which means those sonic waves, they hit with full force. Whereas in the air, sonic waves disperse, right? They don't disperse in water quite the same. I don't know why I'm Interesting. I don't know why I'm so shocked by this new knowledge. I mean, I knew that, you know, they use ultrasound to break up kidney stones. I mean, it's the same It's the same reason. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. It's because you're you I it, just never thought of it this way. It will not harm you. If you only get it in the right spot, it doesn't harm yeah. you. You know, because your jelly bits just kind of shake. Yeah. Your, your hard bits less less shaky, they just yeah. fall apart. See? But, I should be a doctor. I can explain this shit. I mean, I think it's... I'm, <laughs> You'd kill it. That would be awesome. <laughs> it's cool Let me tell you about your jelly bits. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool that you, like, got excited. Like, that's cool. Some people are like, oh, my God. Like, after I see my fifth, like, cataract surgery, I'm, like, bored. But it's really cool. And by the way, there is rolling involved because the he new... He was actually thinking of this when he said it. I was really? like, wow, look, he's got it. <laughs> Go ahead. Have you seen one before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like, the new lens is rolled up, kind of like... um. It's rolled up. I don't know. <laughs> like a squirrel. Kind of like a thing that's rolled up. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a um, croissant. Okay. Because, yeah, because that way, like, instead of having to put this flat sheet of paper, I guess, in through that tiny incision, you can roll it up, put that in the incision, and then it's designed to unfold itself in the right orientation. Yeah. It's really, it's that's like, wild. It, it, it's wild. For your so yeah. the, you can watch them just put it in and then it like unfolds in the right way. It spins a little bit to adjust in the right spot. Now this Okay, that just can, sounds like magic. That's cool. It's really, ophthalmology is, it's really, yeah, okay. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and it's amazing because like you have this patient who couldn't see out of their cataract and then 10 minutes after the surgery, he's like talking to the doctor. He's like, I can see now. Like, thank you. And I'm like, damn. And how long that's is the procedure? Gratifying. It's like 20, 30 minutes. I can't wait to have cataracts. This is exciting. Oh, no, no, Dave. <laughs> long, wrong lesson, but okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> he's confused, but he's got the spirit. But that was right. a very long way to say, that's what I'm hoping to go into. Oh, that's exciting. That's cool. <laughs> you seem very passionate. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. It's, yeah, it's it cool actually, stuff. yeah, it's very endearing to see somebody so excited about the field, so. 
What about you guys? You guys, I mean, do you have any inclinations at this point, whether you're going to do primary care or PA work or you're going to specialize in some way? Noah's looking at me because he's heard my speech multiple times. <laughs> What's <a> speech? <laughs> I chose to go the PA route because of the emphasis in primary care. And I know coming from a rural community, I never always had great access to health care and I want to help close those gaps. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought about family medicine once I considered doing health care. Unfortunately, with the new changes within Iowa, I don't know if I stay in Iowa, I want to do OB. And it's scary to think about it. And I'm a little ashamed of myself for saying that I don't know if I'm comfortable with it. However, I know like moral injury is a thing and I need to make sure I prioritize my own needs. So I don't rush a patient or judge them in the future because of how stressed I am. But long story short, I want to do primary care, family medicine specifically. Um, and yeah. Great. That's awesome. Noah, what do you think? Oh, my, mine's kind of all over the board. I too want family medicine. Uh, primary care. My dad, he's a sixth grade teacher, he's teaching seventh grade now. So I've grown up surrounded by kids and stuff like that my whole life, helping teach. So I think pediatrics would be fun. Uh, the ho- I'd like to think that most people when they're growing up are surrounded by kids by virtue of being one. Yeah. My dad's still a kid. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> awesome. that's, that's why my mom says he's good. He's a good middle school teacher is because he's still a middle schooler. <laughs> and I can't attest to that. Sweet. I uh, thought family practice pediatrics i used to work at a really big hospital back home in colorado and i met a transplant pa Mm -hmm. and that was cool they also get the the surgical and the clinic side and i Mm -hmm. I too am like that i like the kind of duality of it i've also thought oncology i like the relationship with patients and i feel like that gets to a level not seen in other kind of fields Mm -hmm. i think a lot of highs a lot of lows but i think it'd be kind of an interesting field to be a part of and the worst part is the more and more i talk to people and hear their passion for their their field i'm like well that sounds cool i could do that but the eyes are off i can't do eyes that is <laughs> off. yeah i can't do that one can okay. i just say that i think it is i i remember i was a freshman in college and i was sitting in a, in a lab and everybody was talking about you know what they wanted to do with their lives and this one guy said i don't even know what i want to major in because like it's just i'm not really interested in anything and i have never felt so disconnected from another human being yeah. you know like i think it's beautiful when you're like it's all interesting oh, that's yeah. a that's a wonderful mindset and that's for amongst a lot of other reasons but that's something i like about being a pa is yeah, that you can I, bounce i can move between things yeah yeah and you guys don't have the same constraints nope. as mds do where you know if you wanted to change your specialty you'd have to go back through the match you'd have to go back through residency and all that kind of stuff i don't mm-hmm. think that's the same for pas no nope. I, I was thinking about doing that's the awesome. what's his name mm-hmm. the abignali special you know, I don't if know. you guys have ever huh? seen the movie Catch Me If You Can. First gym, now this guy. <laughs> Who are these people? <laughs> <laughs> so there, okay, what crowds so you roll with, man? <laughs> this is a true story. It's a real person. They made a movie. They made a musical. Both are phenomenal. And the, there's a book. He basically was one of the world's greatest forgers. And he would like bounce around different careers. And he would just like oh, yeah. forge all of his... Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah. Yeah, Catch Me If You Can. Yeah. His name was Abagnale. That's his last name. And uh, he forged his documents to be a doctor and he like oversaw an emergency department and, like the only thing that he said was do you concur to one of the residents <laughs> and like that was it <laughs> and i was like i can do that <laughs> oh. so if i ever want to change i'll just do the epping special and just jump into a different specialty yeah. forge some documents nobody that will know sounds yeah. safe you also just admitted to forging documents on a well public podcast. Legal reasons, yeah. this yeah. is a joke <laughs> there it is <laughs> i do you know what i just want to speak up yeah. for jeff he's a real friend of a guy um. <laughs> I, I do want to mention just to anyone listening who maybe isn't sure or like that's okay you know like yeah, it, oh yeah it, it, i think it, it's it, I, yeah. I mean I, you all you have to know at this stage is that you want to do medicine and mm-hmm. yep. all, you, that's something you and some people get all the way to the to their like almost to their application that's stage. what i was gonna say you can literally you can be <laughs> practicing and be like i want to maybe change careers that's or, like, a little more stressful okay. than you want but you know what are you gonna do you've only got so much time in you know in your studies of medicine to figure out what the hell you want to be i mean it's a big decision yeah especially for how in some ways non-mobile mds are once they've 
you know. I have so much respect for the people that like dual apply to residencies. You know, usually you'll apply to residency programs in a specific specialty and then you'll apply to only residency programs in that specialty. When you dual apply, you're applying to more than one specialty, right? So you're applying to different programs. And, and I have met people who basically they said, I'm really interested in both fields and I'll let the match decide which field I go into. And the... <laughs> Dude. The chutzpah on know, those individuals. That's Literally no idea what specialty they're going into on match day, but that's beautiful. Good that's for them. That's amazing. <laughs> it takes guts. It does. Short Coats, if you're enjoying our conversation today, I'd be grateful if you'd let people know by posting a story on Instagram or Facebook or tweeting about us. And don't forget to tag us in your post. Thank you. It's fun to get your medical information from social media. <laughs> So chock full of useful info, but sometimes they can be a little, shall we, shall we say, dubious. Let's see if you can identify what these clips are about after I've censored them unnecessarily. We're going to start with... I hope there's like foghorn censoring. We're going to start... <laughs> I did try to think about like different things other than... And I lost my creativity. So Let's start with this one from YouTube's Naz Daily. I found a woman who will never I'm Linda, and I would really like to Linda is so afraid of that she this. hired a real scientist with real PhDs to find a way to herself. The minute she they want to her body and let it sit there for centuries until science her and make her Again, it sounds crazy, but it's not just her. Even famous people also asked Linda to for $200,000 per Nobody knows if Linda will but according to her, if we can our hearts to other people in 2021, then maybe we can people and them in 2201. Okay, I think we know what. The what I was bleeping out. I All I know so. is Linda. <laughs> <laughs> I should have made this like a buzz in when you get the answer thing, and then that way you would see who got it first. Anyone want to hazard a guess? It's not Jeff. I want to say she doesn't want to die, uh -huh. and she wants to be frozen, yes. like reanimated. Okay. Yes. Something Good job. Solid medical information. Yeah. <laughs> this person's very excited about this about this idea. <laughs> Linda's going to be representing all of us in 200 years. Yeah. All right. Let, well, let's try this one. It's a lot of that's a lot of weight. She's I don't know if I, I don't I don't know if I want to I mean, I I'm excited about the future as anybody. Like I I would really love to find out like you know, whether like if if I if I passed away today, I would. <laughs> I realized that the okay. next line this was going to be a hypothetical. Hint. I'd be bummed. <laughs> I would be sad that I didn't get to find out if Aaron Rodgers recovered well from his uh, <laughs> heel injury. But if I could come back in the future, you'd you know, still find out about. I'd Aaron find Rodgers. out. I, yeah. So I w actually, I'm more interested in like you know whether or not democracy is going to survive or something. You know that. Would be I'd be thrilled to live 200 years, just to, like experience, you know. I don't want to live 200 years. <laughs> That's the thing That's is, it. I don't want to skip yeah. it. I don't want to skip it. Okay. Yeah, I don't okay. think I'm cool enough to freeze myself, one. But two, I don't think that I'd want to like miss out on all the in-between bits. Okay. I, mean, I would like to see You don't want to just read about it. You want to. No, I want to experience it. Okay. I want to see us progress. Because okay. let's be honest, as the optimists in the room, we're getting better. We're doing it. We're going to make it. Oh, I hope you're right. I am not the optimist in the room. I'm sorry I frightened you with the That's with okay. my impending death. No, I, it was just yeah. All right, let's try this. I, I've never heard that phrase before. Well, I'm here to broaden your horizon. <laughs> Doc Jerry Tan has this suggestion for you. Hello again. I'm Dr. Jerry Tan. I'm a Mayo Clinic trained endocrinologist. Ooh. Do you know that eating can optimize your health <laughs> as well as slow your aging process? In a study, researchers have identified several bioactive compounds in that contribute to their anti-aging effect. They are called ergothionine, polysaccharides, and triterpenoids, which contribute and enhance cellular health, combat oxidative stress, 
and tamp down inflammation and cell senescence. Mm. Furthermore, it has been shown eating <laughs> promote healthy gut by <laughs> promoting prebiotic fiber and has antimicrobial properties that supports digestive health. The antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties of eating <laughs> can protect cellular damage and contribute to longevity. For more health tips, please follow me on my YouTube channel and Facebook. Any, this is a harder one. It's something citrus because he oh. said terpenoids yeah. and that's... Oh. Oh. But like aloe vera? Okay, eating aloe vera, eating citrus. Is it go ahead fiber? And suggest that you don't eat aloe vera. Is it grapefruit? Why I'm not, not? A doctor? <laughs> Is aloe vera bad for you to eat? I, I don't know. It's I, crunchy. I, I having seen it in it's, its it natural looks a little state, gross. I would suggest that it's not a plant that yeah. should be put in the mouth. It looks like something works great that's, on the skin. Yeah, it looks like something that fell out of a unguent's nose. But unguent <laughs> is that the right? Oh, what unguent? <laughs> What's the general term for like? Hooved animals for a hooved animal, yeah. ungulid. Ungulid. Yeah. <laughs> I think ungulid. The fact is that like two a... people in this room knew that that, that makes me happy. <laughs> How do you spell yeah. that? I know it starts with a U. U n g u l a n t. I think that sounds ungulid. From un- unguent is like a, a, a salve or a cream. Word. I think it's not. <laughs> it's very different. I learned a word today. I don't. How do we? Where do is we... it grapefruit? Pomegranate. No. I don't know. I want it to be a fruit. I want it to be a fibrous fruit, so oh. something that you eat the skin of. Yeah, but it's mushrooms. Oh, okay. Oh, that's the new. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anybody here hate mushrooms? I love mushrooms. Yeah, I, I love, love mushrooms. mushrooms. My father wasn't actually sure you that I was his son no? because I like mushrooms oh, so much. Okay. No, it's it started out as principle just to be irritating oh. to my mom who loves mushrooms. And my brother, he coined the term, if it grows between your toes, you know where it goes, the garbage. Uh, <laughs> But admittedly, and it's now on a podcast, so she can't hold against me. <laughs> my girlfriend has gotten me to eat mushrooms, and they're not bad. I wouldn't say they're my favorite thing in the world. This but, is um, a very hurtful thing to have your mother know. Like, your girlfriend made you feel good about mushrooms, but I spent all those years trying to cram mushrooms into you. Oh, it's me, my dad, and my brother. So she was outnumbered for the oh. beginning. Yeah, no. Mm. But she got as many as she wanted if there were any in our plates. So it balances out. Okay. Yeah. To, to argue with Dr. Tan just a little bit. Have any How of you, dare you, sir? Have any of you heard he, This of, man is a Mayo trained <laughs> endocrinologist. He may what know are you, things. sir? He may know things. That's fair. Have any of you heard of Hank's Razor? No. It's a new thing. We're trying to get it started. We're going to get it started. It's going to happen. This has to do with Hank Green. It, it does. Okay. It does. He's the one that came up with I, it. And he's I, like, when I die, I want oh. people to remember this razor. This is my thing. This I want people to remember me for this. Okay. Okay. And Hank's Razor is this. If something is associated with better health outcomes and also associated with higher socioeconomic status one should just assume that it's this higher socioeconomic status okay. that's <laughs> contributing to the health outcomes. okay okay yeah if somebody says for example did you know that playing golf contributes to longevity i bet it's being wealthy <laughs> i bet it's not the golf itself <laughs> okay i like that i like that let's try this one one of the most underrated things that you can do for your that slows the decay of the is doing something that fills you with and that can be as simple as in nature yeah. or just which just is a deeply profound experience. You're not going to get this one because I bleeped out no too many words. Yeah. <laughs> it could be as simple as walking around in nature, something that brings you joy. That is exactly correct, Jeff. Something that brings you, in, in his words, awe. Oh, yeah. I, I actually have seen some studies on this. The If you trigger awe in a person, it, man, you know, I guess sorry, you go ahead. It, but uh, it's no, supposed you're doing to... Big, I haven't seen any studies. I just looked at this guy's YouTube video. I got uh, nothing. It's I do. <laughs> it, it, may very well, it may very well be something along the lines of uh, Hank's razor over here, but I, I do remember seeing a study that if you're able to tr- trigger awe in an individual, that they're going to have um, significantly better... Um, pro-social behavior as well as uh, mental health which obviously both of those will contribute to longevity and, and overall health outcomes i have questions if you trigger awe in somebody and they have more pro-social behavior does that mean that the the pro-social behavior right at that moment 
I, I mean, think, uh, yeah, I, so the experience yeah. is a transitory experience. Yeah, and so it's something that is attached to it. So they'll do a survey before and after. Okay. Are you more likely to, for example... Oh, I see. Yeah, participate in a charity event or give money to the guy on the side of the street or go to a gathering or, you know, so those types of things, like I help see. a stranger. I see. The things that we would consider to be objectively good for society, right? Okay. More likely to do it if you've experienced awe recently. I'm down with that. Watch a cataract surgery. Yeah. <laughs> if that triggers awe in you, yes. 100%. <laughs> you know how you know how Justin Sipla spent a lot of time like going around to different departments in the hospital? Just, Justin, is, Justin Sipla is our neurology professor. No, you're not doing this man justice. Justin Sipla is our resident paleontologist. Oh, yeah, that's right, right? He, he's a paleontologist. sometimes spends time teaching medical students about other things. Yeah. <laughs> Neuroscience, I guess, specifically. Yeah. He's just an interesting guy. But he, he spent a lot of time in, in recent years, like, basically traveling around the hospital and, like, doing things with uh, providers, like, going on rounds and things like that and just learning shit. He did the rotations. Yeah. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. He was yeah. a student in the rotations. I don't know where I came. How did I get to here? You guys got to have a good okay. time. Why aren't you guys keeping track of my thoughts? We were talking about awe. <laughs> yes. Um, I feel like he's a guy who probably lives this ethos. Tries to see new and amazing things. Can you get me into a cataract surgery so that I can... I have to get so myself I can have a little, <laughs> <laughs> That's step one. <laughs> I thought you were asking for free health care. No, no, no. I just want to see. I just want to be there. Like, he did it. Why can't, you know, why can't Dave the podcaster get into a uh, cataract? There's lots of, I, I'd love to, like, on, we can go on YouTube and watch a video. There's lots of recorded ones. That's not the ones. same. Oh, sorry. Okay. Not, I want to be there. I want to smell it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there are very few surgeries where I would suggest that. I don't know if there are any, if I'm honest. No. I'm aware that things don't always smell good. But, you know, I want to experience it with my senses. N not the taste. <laughs> I was about to say, you just want to see it. You don't want to know. None of the other senses are going to be a good experience for you. I haven't really thought this idea through. <laughs> but it's there. Well, that's our show. Jeff, Noah, Hind, Olivia, thanks for hanging out with me today, being on the show. Thanks for having us, Steve. Yeah, yeah of thank course. You. Thank you. And what kind of... So would I be if I didn't thank you, Shortcuts, for making us part of your week? If you're new and you like what you heard today, follow the show wherever you get your podcasts, like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube. I'm the producer of this episode today. The show is made possible by a generous donation by Carver College of Medicine Student Government and ongoing support from the Writing and Humanities Program. Our music is by Dr. Vox and Catmosphere. I'm Dave Etler. I'm Dave Etler saying don't let the bastards get you down. Talk to you in one week. Hi, short coats. Look, life in medical education, life in America, life in the world is often difficult. And I often wish I could help. All I have is this podcast, but in my wildest dreams, you have the support you need to lead a life of your choosing. You deserve to be happy, healthy, and successful in whatever ways you define those words. So if you need support because you've experienced racism, discrimination, harassment, mental health crises, I want you to be able to get the help that you need. And so I'm going to put some links in the show notes to some resources that you can use. But the bottom line is that for what it's worth, I see you. I know you're out there. I wish I could do more. Maybe I can in ways that I don't understand yet or know about. But I see you and I'm glad you're here and other people are too. This Shortcode podcast is a proud member of the MedEd Media Network. Inspiration, information, 